website and oh, going to the LinkedIn page. I should tell Asher that. That's really interesting. You should. Interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and I think having having the content, having the background that he shared was 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 pretty interesting to me too because I mean, what, their email list grew from like nine people to like 900 That's or something, crazy, right? crazy, right? Like, give me those types of, you know, <laughs> know. ROI metrics on, uh, on, on demand gen investment. Yeah. But I think we, um, what I, I was, I ended up, it was probably right before I joined Aquia. Yeah. So I ended up settling in and I said, okay, well, let me let me let this sort of organic, or, or maybe not so organic, right? Artificial yeah. partnership ecosystem that I'm about to get handed sort of take priority, yeah. see what I can sort of make of this. And then as we need to expand further, that's a resource that I can tap into. Yeah. Um, and I haven't obviously gone back, but it's probably something that inevitably I'll finally just go ahead and complete that yeah the I've, been, 30 I've, been, yards. I've been looking at it did, did you get an idea of the pricing like how much it is I, if I remember correctly this is I'm, I'm quoting 2019 prices 2020 prices yeah. I think they were in like the 1200 the yeah 1500 yeah, range, they, yeah something right? over a thousand so, so it wasn't super you know like I, it, it's it's an investment right you think of it that way and you could probably see pretty immediate ROI okay cool you could probably see pretty immediate ROI from something like yeah. that um, Especially because their network, you know, in terms of the organizations and the companies that that are their members, and then it sounds based on the metrics that he shared, you know, there's probably two or three members per, you know, sort of blue chip organization. That's, yeah, that's on there. So that's okay. So you open yourself up to a pretty sizable network. How different is that from like the network, you know, that of your, you know, alumni uh, association? How yeah. different is that from? Yeah. You know, obviously they get it because we all understand, you know, partnerships and partner partner marketing is a sort of a nuanced language yeah you know yeah i've been thinking about it too i just it's like do i want to pull the trigger on that right now and i just you know i think partner marketing like that's we sell the partner marketers at right. the end of the day right. i think it's a niche within their organization right. i just don't know how much is there and i also don't want to go in and just sell people like that's not what a community is about yep you know yep. but yep. um you know it might be might be beneficial just to be in there so I, i've been looking at it too you i, I mean what a if nothing else, you can have access to those organizations. Yeah. Within those organizations, the more mature ones are going to have partner marketing yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, teams, if not at least folks that are responsible for it. So you, there, there's sort of like a secondary value there. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for me at that time, it, it, it started to make sense. And when it didn't make sense anymore, yeah. I haven't gone back since. And then of course <laughs> so I saw didn't get you. you. Yeah, I saw your interview and, and I was like, oh, wow, this hey, is I wanted cool. to ask you before we get started. I saw something on your LinkedIn about like an Afghanistan is it a business or group or I've got a lot of Afghanistan stuff. So what what is that? Are you so, is your family from there? Or? I am. So I was born there. I was no born shit. yeah, I was born in Kabul. Wow. Actually I was born in Kabul about four months after the Soviet invasion. And in, uh, so I'm dating myself here, of course, right? Everybody knows how old I am now. Uh, <laughs> darn it, I was really trying to hide that. No, um, we've got uh, we've got a pretty uh, pretty tight connection to the homeland, my family and I, wow. right? Um, and so to this day, I still, if I, not now, obviously, uh, we're talking in 2024 terms, right? I, I don't travel back there, but for quite a while, you know, from 20, 2001 up until, you know, 2021 or so, I was... Probably there every couple of years. Wow. I actually lived there for an extended period from 2016 to 2000, 2015 to 2018. Do you still have family there? I do. Wow. I do. I have, I have some pretty close relatives out there. Yeah. Um, and so I'm all in know, the Kabul, Kabul area? Or? Kabul and vicinity. Okay. Kabul and vicinity. Yeah. yeah. Outside of Kabul, not, uh, my family isn't from outside too far away. So, um, so and most of the folks that, w that were sort of further up north ended up moving you yeah. know, fairly far south. Would you go back now? I would, I yeah. would. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my research, Yeah. right? Like, is it gonna be a, I, I don't think the word that I'm gonna use is safe, more so, is it gonna be comfortable for yeah. me yeah. to be there now, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, there's a lot of other sort of uh, uh, cultural and, and political background that goes into why I'm hesitant. Sure. Otherwise, I actually sure. tell people now that I'm like, in my entire lifetime, this is probably the peacefulest that yeah. Afghanistan's ever been. Yeah. So if you're kind of like, like if you want to go, this is probably the best time to go. This is kind of like circa mid, mid 60s and 70s, yeah. you know, the hippie trail. This is a, the kind of like that arena. Just go in, you don't have to worry about much. Yeah. So for me, on the other hand, it might be a bit more nuance yeah but yeah so i ran a mining company out there i was a, a mining company a mining company wow yeah yeah i was uh, i was a i had a bunch of uh 
Um, I had a bunch of, uh, let's just say, good luck with cryptocurrency. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was one of those. Well, um, and multiple or one in particular? Oh, it was Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah I was, I'm, I was, uh, I'm a Bitcoin. Yeah. Guy. So yeah. my first but, Bitcoin was $7. Oh, oh my God! So that, it, this is, that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> I got lucky. It was you know, um, uh, Sasha, if you're watching this, thank you for the tip. Uh, he's he's great. Uh, he told me about it, kind of clued me in on it, explained to me the whole thing. So I was like, oh, okay, whatever. I'll throw in a hundred bucks. Yeah. Wow. Next thing I know, I'm throwing a thousand bucks. And then oh, next man. thing you know, I was like, wow. Good for you. So I took this investment and I decided to uh, go and uh, build a essentially a mining consultancy. Okay. And then eventually translate that into you know full sort of ownership of a mining claim. In Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. Wow. Because it's a very, it's a very, very resource rich country, yeah, right? A lot yeah. of people don't know that. A lot of people do know that. And so there's a reason why there's, you know, for the last hundred or so years there's been very nuanced politics in that area. Yeah, oh, there's yeah. a lot of value in the land itself. Um, so uh, but they, they made a, a, um, a big lithium discovery there and you know there's obviously a speculation as to how large it could potentially be when fully capitalized but um, so I was like you know what I've got I know the language I know the culture I know the history you know I've got friends and family and contacts over there I've got you know sort of my career behind me here so yeah. I could parlay this into something valuable for for sort of long-term development out there the Canadians have a great proverb they say you don't mind for yourself you mind for your grandkids yeah right and so that was sort of the mantra of my of my of my firm it was just like we're not we're just here planting seeds we don't expect any of this to bear fruit in our lifetimes, but it's like, let's get, let's build decent foundations that can sustain and, and ideally bring these folks out of, you know, pretty, pretty dire situations yeah. in, in the long run, very, very long run. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was sort of what I did. Um, met a lot of great people, worked with a lot of great organizations, international NGOs and, uh, you know, international governing bodies and very cool embassy folks that I met while I was out there. Um, a lot of good uh a lot of good contacts and you know i think i like to look back and think to that experience it's like okay i planted some seeds i still get reach outreach from folks you know they're like hey we you know we saw this we're interested about you know talking to you, yeah. you know, about potential investments and things like that and i'm like i don't actually invest there at the moment but you know you want to hop on a call and i can sort of walk you through how yeah you get a good you know, network for yeah that kind of it's stuff. very interesting and i feel it's like you have this entrepreneurial spirit yeah i get like, that I, a lot I, of people have been telling me that yeah, all I my can, life i can but feel like, it yeah coming just, off you. just go and sell <laughs> lemonade on a street corner that's what they told me when i was five and of course that that kind of stayed with me throughout no um i think there's there, there's a certain level of um and you get this too right like you you meet somebody like we connected Right? Yeah, so random. So random. We should talk about that. We, we absolutely for, should. First of all, cheers for having a beer with uh, me. I appreciate pleasure. this. My um, pleasure. Thank you for yeah, having me. You know, well, I have it, you know, this show, it's a, it's a mix of like, it's supposed to be just sitting down for coffee, beer, cocktail, whatever, because that's what I did for the last 20 years. I just yeah. went around and met with, you know, various people in tech and had coffee and beers with them and learned a lot, right? And so now yeah. I get to share it with everybody. But the last couple episodes, probably the last five or six I've done, it's all been coffees and teas, and so like, <laughs> it's nice to have a beer, especially after a long day. See, so. I give you the balance. I give you the tea, of course, because yeah, know, <laughs> that's so funny. Um, we we uh, we should talk about how we met. Yeah, and the connection. There. We should. I'll let you lead it. This is your it, it, stick. It's <laughs> well, I mean, you probably just experienced this, you know, especially traveling in other parts of the world, like just how small of a world it really is. Oh my Right, so it was. I have a fun fact for you. Yeah, go. My, my sister jokes with me. She goes, "Your nickname should be Snapple Fact. You throw out this random stuff that like nobody should know." So, I read an article once that you know the term, the world is you know the six degrees of separation yeah. in the world, so on and so forth. So apparently, Facebook, well, Meta now, right? But at the time, Facebook did analysis over their data set. Like, okay, well, we can take our statistically significant sample of users and extrapolate across the global population. And they're like, no, humanity is actually only 4.5 degrees of separation. 4.5? Yeah. Wow. So the whole, I mean, six wasn't too far off. That's yeah. kind of impressive. You yeah. Know? Uh, at that time, I would think it was just anecdotal. But now, like, there's actually data to support that. I believe it. I've had, I've had friends that don't know each other. And I've known in different parts of the world. So, like, I had one friend in New Orleans, one friend in California. They met each other in London, and after three hours of them meeting each other, they realized I was I was their connection point. <laughs> Just totally awesome. random in London, right? right? So and they didn't have to pull up Facebook to find that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, so all right, so you, you work at Aquia. We're yes. gonna we're gonna dive into that. You all were doing a golf tournament in Colorado. Yep. I don't even golf. 
Last time I golfed <laughs> was like great. seven years ago. I golf like I don't golf. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> and, and and you know, I show up at the golf tournament, and you're this cool dude with sunglasses, <laughs> drinking beers, making everyone have a good time. And how did we even realize that we both grew up in the same home, same town of Alameda, California? And it somehow it came up. Yeah. And we realized we went to the same high school, probably yeah. at the same time, too. Yeah, if I remember correctly, you're actually, you were there, and you were the year of my younger sister. Yeah, yeah I think um, so. And we, she and I overlapped for two years yeah. at Alameda High. So That's crazy. really strange. Small I think town. somebody mentioned that, oh, Waleed just flew in from, uh, oh, the Bay from Area or something. Bay Area yeah. this morning. And then you're like, oh, yeah, I'm from the Bay Area. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, when I hear Alameda anywhere, I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> ding, that, ding, ding. That's a small town. It is. It is. We, it, I, I tell people, I'm like, if you've ever met a Rashid in Alameda, chances are it's one of my siblings. Yeah. So, well, like, hey, that's it. <laughs> so, so what do you do at Acquia? Uh, so, um, I, so I, I've been with Acquia now four years, and uh, going on four years actually. And uh, my my responsibility is sort of managing the Western sort of enterprise partners uh, that we have, and in, yeah, kind of just getting to know them, folks like yourself. Yeah. Figuring out, you know. What's your go-to-market strategy? What are you guys uh, specialized in? Where are you guys looking to expand? What are your, you know, strengths and you know, and trying to figure out, identify your weaknesses that you may not be telling me. Take that, and then try to connect it to our sales organization. You know, we've got sales motions uh, globally. My responsibility is definitely uh, North American focused, but the, uh, you know, sort of can make building that connection of like the right partner yeah. that can deploy our open source. So, you know, software um, the right way. Uh, that's that's. I'm I've, I'm always struggling with how to explain what I do to folks who aren't in our industry. Yeah. Um, that it's rare I have to actually explain it to somebody who already knows. Yeah. You know what I mean? Would you Would you say it's like a business development role? Is that the best way to? No, classify I'm actually. It I, I I described it once like that, and somebody I almost felt like I got the uh, the the proverbial slap on the wrist. Like, really? How dare you describe it as that? I'm like, <laughs> Because I'm like, you know, it, to some extent, there is a lot of business development in there, and but really, I think it, it comes down to identifying where organizations are really complementary to ours, you know, and because they're not all gonna work out, you know. We we get we get folks uh, that are interested in joining the par Aquia Partnership ecosystem that, you know, for better or for worse, we just have to, you know, say thanks but no thanks. Yeah, um, and that's you know. Uh, the Acquia, uh, you know, digital experience platform sits on the Drupal open source framework. Right there is a, you know, that's sort of like, if you don't know that, then if you don't understand that, you're not familiar with that, right? Um, we've got a, we've got a long road of enablement. We're gonna you know, start the there because end of that because yeah. I don't know what the Drupal open source platform is. So explain that. Explain so that to me. <laughs> oh wow. Uh, the short so road version. History, of it. yeah, history. <laughs> so, so our founder, Dries Butart, is um, is the creator of. Drupal. Okay. So he was in college, you know, typical. I mean, we're in Silicon Valley, right? College kids sitting, you know, cra cracking that code. Uh, created this Drupal framework that was uh, that was released to the to, to the open source world as a solution for creating content. Okay. Right. And being able to manage and host that content. Like what? Like website content. Website right? content. Okay. Precisely. So this was back in the days of like Joomla, right? When WordPress was sort of just probably taking off. Maybe not even before that, realistically, right? Um, and so, uh, it was, it was so successful initially and a lot of, it had a lot of adoption, um, it, to the extent that a bunch of enterprises started reaching out and saying, well, this is great, but how about security? How about scalability? How about governance? And, uh, you know, fortunately he was savvy enough that he was like, yeah, we can, we can do that. And sort of what you see at Acquia is the commercialized version of that open source Drupal framework. So, you know, annually throughout the United States, throughout the world actually, there are, you know, Drupal camps that are taking place. DrupalCon is a big annual event that takes place. And so the whole Drupal community is representative of, I think, over 40,000 contributors. Wow. Right? Huge. And so um, that community, obviously, they've got, you know, the, the, the chops and the experience to be able to deploy Drupal. Within Acquia, we are the commercial facing Entity that Got it. that's capable of providing the security guarantees and the SLAs and the uptime and so on and so forth from a hosting standpoint. And so Acquia has evolved over the last, you know, is even to the extent, even in the time frame that I've been exposed to Acquia directly, it's evolved, hmm. which was interesting because I remember being a partner of Acquia on the outside, and it was, you know, Acquia was a CMS. That's what we did. We talked to Acquia whenever we needed a content management system. You know, fast forward, late, you know. 
le less than two years later, and I'm in Acquia as you know, in uh, sort of as a member of the team, and as you know, you sort of go through the boot camp and you know you're you know onboarding, and I'm just like, wow, this is so much more than I thought um, was originally viable. So I think a lot of my uh, my challenges and really opportunities are, you know, identifying where folks who would be a, you know, a good partner with Acquia yeah. are, um, are, are in that understanding of Acquia's capabilities and solution stack. And so if they are, if they're, if they're familiar, great, let's, let's go to market, right? And that's where, you know, the, the, the partner marketing activities come in, the yeah. management comes in, the thought leadership and, you know, whether it's webinars or roadshows or golfing events yeah. in Denver, right? Um, and for those who aren't familiar with Acquia and, you know, how we sort of fit into the greater, you know, market, Mar Martech stack, you know, it's it's sort of a you know, crawl walk run approach. Yeah, I know that makes sense. I want to get into how you came from the partner side into Acquia from a partner. First, a little rapid fire. So, I, I just you know, my goal with this show is really that that listeners really get to know you as a guest. So okay. I got a, I got a couple rapid fire questions for you. Should be fun. <laughs> they tend to go slower than rapidly. So, <laughs> I think you called it thunder fire. Yeah. Right? Or, or your wife calls it thunder. My fire. marketing team has branded it as rapid fire, and my wife just she's like, "You're the slowest person asking these questions." <laughs> um, all right, best piece of professional advice you have ever received. Um, data to information to action. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, Okay, favorite way to unwind from a long day? Mountain biking. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just do that in Colorado next time in golfing. Right. Well, I'm a Bay Area native, right? And yeah. Oh, that's right. We as did the same trail as the walking. Right. As far as we're convinced, yeah. it was, you know, it was founded here in, in, in Mount Tam. I know. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I, I got buddies up Colorado in Colorado just blows it out of the water. Colorado's, yeah. So oh. I, I've, got to, I've got to either bring my bike out there or I'll borrow one of yours. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit, I, I love mountain biking. I haven't, with three young kids, I haven't really mountain biked in like seven years. So my, Preaching to the choir, buddy. My kids Preaching are starting to, to like, my, my oldest seven-year-old, she just got like a small mountain bike. So we're Good. starting to get into Slowly it. Slowly but surely. Yeah. All right, most adventurous thing you've ever done? Besides opening a company in Afghanistan. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> that's kind of, that's, um, well, you know what? I, uh, I, Eagle Rider over here in San Francisco rents out Harley Davidson's. And I remember I had like a, Bit of a work sabbatical. Yeah, like I'd, I'd left my previous company, and then you know the next role wasn't going to start for like a month and a half, and I was like, well, what do I do? Uh, so I rented one of their Harleys, and I just rode it down PCH to San Diego. Oh, cool! And uh, and and the plan was to ride it all the way back to yeah. real confidence, and uh, it was you know sort of early spring at the time, and I think I hit like Orange County ish. And all of a sudden, this rainstorm started, and it was in LA. It was brutal, right? And I'm like, really? Oh, geez. my luck. Uh, and and I'm not even like on you know the 405 or the five at that point. I'm like deep inland on the 15. Oh. Um, so I so I, here I'm at the 15, and I'm like, okay. It, I, I stopped every couple you know miles, and I like, checked my phone. I'm like, is this weather pattern gonna end? And I'm looking at the Doppler, and it, I mean, this thing extends way north of Fresno. Oh, geez. and I'm like, there's no way. I'm gonna make this. Yeah. So I, uh, so I cut west, right, from the Inland uh, Empire, and I cut west all the way across and went straight to LAX. Fortunately, they have an Eagle Rider location there. <laughs> Called them. I was like, guys, they're like, come on in. So we'll take. So I dropped the bike off, booked the flight, and flew home. Oh like, man, not happening. How was it on the way down? It was though? amazing. Yeah, it was, was it? absolutely amazing. That's so, cool. Yeah, that was fun. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really glad I did it. I haven't ever had the chance. Yeah. To do it again, so I'm like, okay, cool. Itch, scratch, done, bucket yeah. list, you know? <laughs> I love it. All right, if, last one. If you could switch careers for a day, what would you do? Oh, I'd, be a, um, I'd be a doctor. Yeah? I love medicine. Yeah. It's kind of neurotic What kind of doctor? Weird. Like, uh, probably crazy. E yeah, I was going to say ER yeah. doctor, yeah. It's exciting, yeah. you know? Did I you watch the sh Did you watch, like, the ER I used to shows? watch yeah. ER when I was a kid, yeah. and it was at a time when I was like, okay, I'm going to be... Uh, I'm gonna be an ER doctor. Doogie Howser, right? Doctor, or, uh, right? Or yeah. right? Doogie Howser, yeah. MD, or and so I really liked it. And I remember up until a certain point in my life, I was like, if I get to a point where I'm just like, you know, I win the lottery, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I can I can afford it. I'm just gonna enroll in medical school tomorrow <laughs> and go be like a. You and you I know, have you and I have different versions of winning the lottery. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to med school. 
<laughs> well, it's funny because the cryptocurrency thing, right? Yeah. Like, it technically had me almost there. Wow. I, and I should have done that, but instead I said, I'm going to go build a mining company yeah. in the third world country. <laughs> Why not? So. Well, you got a long life ahead of you, knock yeah, on wood. Knock I mean, on wood. You, you, you can still chase that dream. <laughs> All right, so back to Acquia. You came over through partnership. Walk me through your background and like how we got to that point. So I, uh, I was... Um, it was funny, I you know, came back from Afghanistan and I stumbled into partnerships. Before going to Afghanistan, I was, uh, I was in the agency world here in San Francisco, Santa Monica, um, you know, and, and up and down the West Coast. I did a lot of agency work and client services and delivery and you know, I, was, I was decent, I, you know, I'll, say, I'll say that, at sort of you know, maintaining the relationships, managing the relationships, ensuring that, the, you know, that the every, everybody sort of you know, meeting their KPIs. Yeah. Um, but people had always told me, well, you should go into sales. In fact, I think I remember somebody once stopping me, uh, or like, you know, I was chatting with somebody on an airplane once, and they're like, son, if you were selling a house, I'd buy it. <laughs> I was like, well, thanks. I'll take that as a compliment. He goes, you should go into real estate. And I was like, yeah. I, was like I don't really want to become a real estate agent. Yeah. You know, I, 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 it's not, uh, for, at the time for me, you know, it's, done plenty of real estate transactions since and I'm like no it's far more complex than most people think you know but um, I think at the uh, at the time I was just like no I want something more technical and so for me the partnerships role becoming available uh, it was kind of offered to me it was on a I wasn't even looking for it and I met with the CEO of this uh, of this um, uh, SI out of Chicago at the time and he was like I like you he goes I think you should be our partnerships person Hmm. Um, and I'd, I'd done sort of partnerships, and I'll put that up in quotes, right? Yeah. Because again, we talked earlier about the the, the the verbiage of our industry is quite nuanced, and yeah. not everybody really understands what you mean a lot of times when you're describing it. And um, we we started having this great conversation, and I thought it was a client services, you know, type uh, role that he wanted me to take on. But um, he's like, no, he goes, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit different. And he came from the sales world, so he he was able to articulate it to me, and I was like, yeah, this sounds. Kind of like what I've done on the project management side and client services side, but I see where it's actually driving, you know, revenue. It's driving, you know, pipeline. And yeah. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a, uh, you know, right place at the right time, I guess. I stumbled into it. Wow. And um, <laughs> it was funny because the first week uh, I, I started this role, I'm going through training uh, with, you know, at the time my my VP, um, <laughs> and that Friday. I'm, you know, I'd, I'd had a, a trip planned. This was in Chicago, by the way. Um, I had a trip planned to fly back out here to the Bay, so I'm at the airport, about to fly back, and my new CEO calls me. He goes, hey, by the way, I just fired your boss. So I'm like, what? <laughs> this is the end of the first week, and I just went, wow. through a week, I went through a week of training, right? And I'm like, okay, so this should be interesting. Got to remember everything I learned in that first week, right? Yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to have some problems. <clears throat> How, how much did that scare you at that point? Like, did you feel like you were making the wrong, you made a wrong decision, or uh, cause, I was because that's not something anyone ever expects walking mm -hmm. into their their first week on the job, right? I was genuinely concerned that this was a sign, more so of the company's state than of his individual state. Yeah, and so I was like, if this um, <clears throat> if if this is where the company's headed, then did I make the right decision? Yeah, you know what I mean. <clears throat> so. We uh we decided oh, this is not gonna work. I'm gonna have to go with the hard stuff. <laughs> we'll get another beer. I know, right? Take a pause. Mm. <laughs> numb up the uh, numb up the nerves, right? That's what it does. It's really effective. Um, so we uh we get to uh you know I fly back into Chicago the next week and he's like, all right, cool. You went through training last week, right? And I'm like, kind of. Yeah. He's like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. So I I I spent the, you know the next. Uh, you know, so, sort of few weeks figuring out, okay, where things were at and, and trying to just apply the bare bones basics that I had been taught in that first week. And, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, uh, people get upset, but I'm like, look, we're not smashing atoms here, right? Yeah. This is, you know, we, we can, you, you can figure your way out through this stuff if you're willing to put in the time and you've got, you know, an ample amount of resources. Um, so that's what we did, put together this partnerships organization, Form partnerships with a bunch of different, um, you know, technologies, technology companies at the time, and Aquay being one of them. Hmm. So, uh, so fast forward, I moved from Chicago um, to San Diego, and uh, and they don't. This was pre-COVID, so you know, no remote work. Yeah, oh so yeah. I've got to go to San Diego. Uh, I had my, my second daughter was on the way, and uh, and we uh, so we parted ways, and then COVID hit, and Aquay was like, hey, we need somebody on the West Coast. 
uh, are you, we noticed that you relocated or, to San Diego. And I was like, yeah. So they reached out. So I was a COVID hire. It was yeah. a very interesting experience coming on board. I, I think it was a, I mean, it was only a few months before I met my first colleague in mm -hmm. person. But I think it was almost two years before I got to see HQ. Really? Yeah. Wow. It was really interesting. Wow. Um, what a different world. Huh? Yeah. There was an opportunity to see HQ, if I remember correctly, in my first six months, but I ended up getting COVID. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I had to cancel that. Um, it, so, you know, you're driving partnerships. You, you seem like a very in-person kind of kind of guy. What was it like those two years in terms of driving partnerships where everything's virtually? God, we got really creative. Yeah. Because most people did, you know. Um, everything from, you know, sending cheese platters to people's desks and having them walk through, uh, you know, the DXP conversation with a sommelier on the on the, on hmm. the line, you know. Yeah, we went. I think we did um, we did steak prep courses, right? Um, you What's know? steak prep? Like essentially, a chef gets on 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 his Zoom, yeah. and all of you are sitting at home on your Zoom. We send everybody a slab of meat. Oh, right? yeah. We tell him how to prep it the night before, and then we arrive, and we he goes through the whole grilling thing. And then, wow! And obviously, in between, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we're we're throwing in anecdotes yeah, and yeah. actually having, you know productive discussions but it was funny because imagine as exciting and enticing and delicious especially at this time of day that that sounds yeah. right that started to just yeah. drop in yeah. both at, i mean never mind roi but like attendance people just got burnt out people got tired of being yeah. on these uh you know on these zooms I'm still tired of it I, I, amen, <laughs> amen. so for me i think what i what i learned pretty quickly and i was i i think i uh i, I had folks actually telling me early on too they're like hey you know you're uh you're on the road quite a bit, right? So as soon as I felt like people were willing to meet, mm -hmm. I would go. Yeah. And at that time, fortunately, our leadership didn't have a problem. They said, "Look, if you know, if, if we, if, if you know, go where the re go where the revenue yeah. is, go where the business is, or go where the opportunity goes." And and so we had partners that were some of them were absolutely willing to get together in person. And so um, I, uh, I I started hitting the road um, probably about once every two months at the time, right? Not too often, maybe once every three months even. But just enough that um, I would do it in such a way that I could sort of knock out three or four partners in yeah, a city. Yeah. So like Chicago was a destination, you know, Southern California was a destination. And obviously I lived down there, so it, wasn't, yeah. it was just a drive. But um, like Dallas and Houston and Austin, we did a, we literally made a, a couple of sales guys. We started in Dallas and drove the three cities hmm. over the course of two days because we're like, this is the only way it's going to happen. And so yeah. we covered essentially all of Texas and San Antonio. But we did, you know, uh, that ended up being really valuable for them and for me, I think, and for the partners that we work with. Um, so getting, I think, there is a f fine balance if we had to go back to, you know, full on screen yeah. all the time. There's, you know, there's probably ways we manage it like we did. Um, but I think the night, the hybrid at the moment is probably the most ideal. I think so too. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot that can be done tactically over Zoom. You and I could have done this over Zoom. Yeah. But it's, it's just not the same. It's not the same. It's just not the same. You know, and that's right. why, like, you know, this is technically, I mean, we record this for video. It's technically right. a podcast, and there's a lot of podcasts done yeah. virtually, but I'm not as good. Right. You know, and, and it, you know, and, I, and that means that the conversations I'm going to have are just not going to be as natural and authentic, and right. the show is all about authenticity. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's some people that could probably do it better virtually, but I, I think there's just something lost when you lose that in-person interaction. There's a lot of nuance and, you know, I, I, I can't remember if I said on the show or to someone else recently, but, you know, my best business deals have not been in the meeting, but it's been on the way to or from the meeting, yes. you know? Yeah. And I mean, that's, there's just a lot that happens yeah. outside of that, that 30 minute meeting, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's trust, right? Do I, can I trust this person? Yeah. Right. Is this person competent? You know, can I can I can I sort of hand them whether it's a budget or a, 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 a some other definition of resources and and know that be confident that they're gonna you know uh, deliver ROI yeah, or yeah. Uh, give me the results I need. Um, and then there's that you know they say je ne sais quoi right like it's like is is there chemistry you know can we d d uh, do we click? Um, it's pretty shocking how, and that's subconscious. I don't think most yeah. people are, are explicitly aware of that, you know, uh, of, 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 of that dynamic. Um, uh, 
Uh, and that's hard to get over a screen. Yeah, it just yeah. it really is. So I think you're right. I think the hybrid is kind of an ideal role because there's still a lot of business that can be done yep. that doesn't have to be in person. Yep. But you know, if, if that's your world, I think you're missing you're missing something. Yeah. Yep. You know. Um, so I want to ask, in terms of your background from yep. from the agency world to running mining companies in Afghanistan, like what is what is that taught you that's really helping you today? That that you know, what are your big takeaways that's really helping you? Be successful driving partnerships. I think that variance for me, that you know, ha having those sort of very disparate experiences, on a, on a, you, I then have to naturally parlay that, whether it's via a bias or you know, preconceived notion or, um, or referencing a past experience in in the context of a new uh, interaction. It it gives me breath, you know. Um, I, I, I often struggle with the with the challenges. You know, I'm sure a lot of people do. Of you know, you know, being able to operate a mile wide and only an inch yeah. deep. Um, and so for me, I think what partnerships has allowed me to do is kind of create that inverse histogram, right? So like there is an area in which I am truly, you know, as deep as I possibly can be. Mm -hmm. But I've got just enough exposure from, you know. You know other things that I've done, other things that I've tried, other things that I'm sure I'll try in the future. Yeah. You know I don't think that I don't think that roller coaster of 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 you know of of experiences is is done by any stretch of the imagination. I'm I'm, I'm still that guy look, looking for like mm, that sounds there's a problem that we can. In fact, it's funny. I I <laughs> I discovered a. Uh, I mean, you're familiar with Crossbeam, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you know they just uh, congratulations to the team, right? They just merged with Reveal, which I think is. Awesome. Yeah. I discovered Crossbeam because I was so annoyed that something like Crossbeam wasn't presented to me in that first one week of training. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I had this one week of training. I should know everything, yeah. right? Uh, I should know all the technologies, all the solutions that are out there. How come nothing like this was? So I, I literally started digging around the internet, um, you know, 2019-ish, uh, for something that would allow me to do what Crossbeam allows you to do. It was really interesting um, because I, I, before I stumbled across it, I was like, "All right, that's it. I am gonna build this technology. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get together some 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 you know some engineers. We're yeah. gonna find me an SC, find a CTO and a product guy. I'm gonna you know hire some marketing people. We're gonna you know, we're gonna put this together. Get some VC funding. I know other people will see the value in something like this, right? So yeah. I'm like, I'm totally about it. And obviously, I'm thinking, like, man, if I hadn't had such a high burn rate in Afghanistan, I totally could have bootstrapped this myself. <laughs> right? Anyways, 2020 hindsight, right? Um, but uh, but then I stumbled on Crossbeam, and I was like, oh, great. Okay, it doesn't exist. I guess I don't have to go and you know, <laughs> build a startup. But so I, I think that I can't turn that off. Yeah. That's yeah. always going to be there. See, so like I said, you're an entrepreneurial <laughs> guy. I mean, you just, you just are. So I want to ask a little bit about the, the go-to-market strategy with, with partners at Acquia, mm -hmm. you know, spe specifically as it relates to your role. So yeah. like, you know, how are you, how do you know if you're doing a good job? Is it come down to, to, to sales, sales on your partner side? Like, what are your success metrics and, and what are you trying to achieve at the end of the day with your partners? Yeah, yeah. Um, in, the, in the end, right, we're, we're not here, uh, somebody, somebody wants to put it, right, we're not here for butterflies and rainbows, right? Like, bottom line, right? Yeah. Is it driving value for the organization? And in and, and some cases, the value may not even be dollars. It may be, you know, number of customers, right? It may be uh, uh, the win of a huge logo at a, at a you know, at a, at a sort of a potential financial loss in the short term, but you recognize the value that that's going to present in the long run. So yeah, let's take it, you know? Um, we've, uh, so I think bottom line metrics are obviously a, a given, but there are leading indicators, you know? A successful partner is going to drive pipeline, is going to drive qualified pipeline, is going to help you um, not just close a deal, but that deal that you bring them into or that they bring you into, you're both able to essentially expand into a much larger opportunity because you recognize there's more need. There's, there's other challenges that haven't even you know, been surfaced. Um, again, from my client services background, I, I learned very early on the clients have no clue what they're doing, right? And, and the vast majority of the time <laughs> in the agency world, I used to joke around and, and uh, stole it from one of my former colleagues is like you know our job is to walk in and tell you that your baby's ugly <laughs> right but we're gonna make it beauty pageant ready yeah so just give us you know a little bit of time um, and some of your attention and resources and I think the 
the partners that collaborate well together are able to identify, you know, the, the future beauty pageant winner, so to speak, right? Like, there is, there's the issues that the clients will typically be cognizant of, right? The challenges, the obstacles, the threats in, in, the, in the marketplace. And then there's all the stuff that they're completely blind to, hmm. right? Um, and, and whether it's because they're just so fixated on a specific metric or a specific objective, or because they're you know they're focused on service delivery, they're sort of, they're focused on the customer experience and not thinking about what's happening in the competitive landscape or what's happening with you know innovations in technology and, and regulation regulatory changes. Yeah. So I think the right partners will a a bring value from that perspective as well. Um, so yeah, leading indicators going to be you know. Driving opportunities, qualified pipeline, helping us close deals, and then beyond that, right? It's now you've got a mutual customer that you're, you know, collaborating on. How engaged and involved are you in the long-term success of this relationship for both parties? You know, um, uh, the 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 <clears throat> the prevalence of of customers saying. You know, we're going to stick with the technology, but not with the service delivery provider. I think is is far more common than the client saying we're going to keep the agency that recommended this technology and scrap the technology. Hmm. Right? Yeah. It's it's and so uh, in that regard, we obviously want to work with partners that that are able to deliver good service on a consistent basis. Right? Yeah. Because if if we if it gets to a point where there there's a question of the value that they're bringing to the clients. We have to be in that awkward conversation, right? Yeah, and, and we want to be because they're our partner. We want to ensure that you know they're uh, they're well represented. But at the same time, you know, in the end, make sure you have to make sure the customers uh, is set for success. You right? you have a lot underneath you in terms of what you need to focus on <laughs> in any given day, day from Quite from your sales team, partner sales team, your marketing team, partner. I mean, it just goes down the list yeah. all the way to the customer, right? How to do the you, nth power based on the number of partners right. you have. And the number of customers you have. Yeah, how do absolutely. you how do you stay focused? How do you manage it? How do you get everybody in line? Like well, I just don't. Do you, <laughs> I just don't know. It's whack-a-mole, yeah. you know. And I uh, somebody, some, one, one of my uh, actually uh, my f uh, first job out of college, he, uh, my old boss um, Avant Monte. If you're watching this, kudos to you. Thank you. He's the one that taught me data to information to action. But he also once said, he said, you know, there's going to be stuff that falls off the plate. You just have to be, you have to be in charge of what's going to fall off the plate, right? There has to be a natural sort of prioritization there. And 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 like I said earlier, a lot of times maybe the 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 north star for the organization isn't necessarily revenue, whether it's that year, that quarter, or that month. Maybe it's this is a, you know, marquee logo that we need to, you know, sort of bring into the ecosystem, well, okay, then, so the, that's the priority, right? That cannot fall off the plate yeah. and the rest of the stuff. So, yeah, I think there is a certain balancing act that does have to take place in terms of prioritization and recognizing, um, you know, where to lend, one time, one, lend one's time and, and energy and focus, right? Like, focus in and of itself is a resource, a very rapidly... <laughs> yeah, a rapidly deteriorating resource. La um, last time we talked, you mentioned the power of three. Yeah, can you can you explain what the power of three is and, and what that means to your role? Uh, I hope I'm not sharing trade secrets here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but th th we we at Aquia recognize you know um, our our s sort of marketing stacks our solution. Um, needs partners that can de deploy that, whether that's you know solutions integrators or consultancies or agencies or you know Jim and Joe out of their mom's garage, mm -hmm. right? Like we've got the full gambit. Um, but our technology, by nature of the fact that it is a technology that's built within a specific platform, is 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 not going to have certain features that those customers are going to want. But as we've seen. Pretty evidently, right in the last you know two three decades, the convergence of all of this technology um, is inevitable, right? And you know, in some places it's converging this way, and in some places it's converging this way. But I think overall we're going to see you know this level of convergence. Um, and so, data, marketing, technology, experience, content, right? All of this is now starting to be discussed in the same rooms, let alone the same teams. Um, and, and, and is, is a part and parcel of a successful strategy within 
all types of organizations, and that's you know, uh, state, you know, whether that's the public sector or the private sector, you yeah. see these same issues come up. Um, I think the the I totally lost my train of thought because I just I was so passionate about articulating the fact that these topics are being discussed everywhere else. You have to remind me. Power of three. Power of three. Thank you. So that's where I was going with this. So what we realize is this: you've got a you've got a technology like Aquas. It's great, yeah. right? We're the best, right? But like, that totally sounds like a sales pitch. But there's going to be other technologies that we just don't have, right? Right. But are are necessary, and maybe in five years' time, it's all going to be one. But today, it's not. And so, how do we bring those technologies into the sort of the ecosystem in a way that that doesn't cannibalize on them, doesn't cannibalize on us, allows our partners to still be the you know the sort of the strategy experts and the you know and the execution sort of folks that they want to be. Um, and so the power of three is recognizing our technology is not every technology, right? If you, a great example, right? Um, our partnership with uh, Amazon Web Services, right? Great example of a power of three. Yeah. Uh, scenario um, and 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 others right other Acquia has uh, as as a DXP and Drupal as a, a sort of uh, base code has solutions for search and commerce and content and assets and media and so on and so on and so on and so forth right but some clients are like no I really like my you know whatever hmm. I'm trying to think of a, a really uh, vague and ambiguous name, so I don't have to pay for copyrights. <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I like Acme, whatever, yeah. and so I want to use that. Okay, cool. Well, let's. If, and if we see enough of those instances, yeah. well, we're naturally going to reach out to Acme and say, you know, what? there's a power of three motion here that we need to leverage. Yeah. The marketplace is clearly demanding it, right? There's value in it for 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 the cus- for the customer. So how can we make this, you know, an easier lift for them? Um, and so that's sort of our one of our go-to market. Yeah. What, what are you seeing as some of the biggest challenges to either your your role today in the industry, you know, within you know partnerships in general? Like, what's what's really challenging you or challenging your peers that you're seeing happening today? I think, um, as as with all things, right, technology expands, right, and 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 t- to the point I made earlier, whether it's content, media, assets, right. Uh, strategy, it, it, data, analytics, it's all sort of starting to converge, but in order for that convergence, it, it, there's this expansion, and it's you see variations, right? Whether you call it, 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 if you look at it in like historical terms, right, there's like schools of thought almost, right? Yeah. The mock alliance, and like, you know, so I can give you a, a, examples like that. So there's these different schools of thought, and I think that breadth does create options, which is great, a lot of times, not the best options, right? And we see technologies get deprecated every day, right? Because somebody was like, great, we're going to build this. Oh, in fact, it doesn't actually work. Okay, right. so, you know, end of life it, and, <laughs> and then you come back here. So I think the biggest challenge um, that, one, one of the biggest challenges, I won't say the biggest challenge, definitely not the biggest, but one of the biggest challenges that we see, that I see in my personal experience, is that you've got this, this sort of fragmentation of technologies and uh, options that are available in the marketplace people kind of like chasing the new shiny object and then realizing that they've just set themselves back, you know, 12 to 18 months. Hmm. And so it's like, okay, quick, pivot back, scramble. You know, um, there are folks really, you know, looking long-term at, okay, this inevitable convergence is going to take place, you know, um, and 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 are, are, are they investing from that perspective or are they kind of just trying to follow the shiny object in the room today? Hmm. And we see that quite often. So I think a lot of the with the partners or customers, customers, yeah, okay. Customers. And I think a lot of, and maybe that's my bias from the agency world, yeah. right? That I'm like, you know, a lot of uh, a uh, a retail, you know, uh, a retail sort of clothing customer is going to know retail clothing really freaking well. I don't expect them to understand the marketing stack that well, right? That's where you know, client, that's where partners come in. Yeah. That's where Acquia is supposed to come in. Um, so. To each his own, and when you end up, when they end up, sort of start to chasing, start chasing and dictating that um, that strategy internally without um, a good sort of solid understanding of what it is, uh, what, what it's capable of, and where they're going as an organization, and will it meet those needs in six to twelve months? Um, that's when you end up having, uh, you know, 
end of life announcements that impact. You know. so, it sounds like you know at the end of the day you have to have some tough conversations, not just with the customers, but earlier earlier on you were, you were talking about the partners and just having a a reality check of what you guys are good at and you know where are the shortcomings. Like that's is that a big part of your job in terms of just providing honest feedback in a in a way that helps people move forward? Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I talk to partners and I tell them we're not going to be the square peg um, in the round hole. Mm -hmm. We'll bow out. You know, and it, in fact, if you recognize that it's a situation where we are the square peg in the round hole, let us know and we'll again bow out. Um, and vice versa, right? Yeah. Certain, certain customers are like we need a, a, a strategy agency that has you know uh, ability to scale content. Okay, well if we've got a partner that is great at strategy, not so great at scaling content. Yeah. Square peg around hole. Like yeah. let's just have that con candid conversation. I think um, you know earlier I mentioned sort of trust, right? Can I work with this person? Can I trust this person? Can I? I, th I, I, a big part of what I do, to the chagrin of I think of a lot of folks that I work with, is I'm just brutally transparent. Yeah. Right. Like I, I like, you're not gonna work here. Sorry. You know I'm willing to work and sort of mold this thing and shape it. You know you got to work with me. You got to invest. We got to yeah. you know take some time. Let's be patient. We can grow. Right, like I said, not every partner that comes on board is ready to go. I'm smiling because I, you know, I, early in my sales career, I was like most sales reps. I would just say whatever the customer wants to hear. Right? right. Yes, yes, right. yes. And you know, obviously not today. Like I'm just no. brutally honest. Like no, we can't do that. Yeah. You know, and like we can dance around, dance around, dance around, and in the end, end up at the same point in six to twelve right. months where you're right. disgruntled, we're frustrated. I'd rather work with you at a later point, or when you go yes. to another company where it makes sense, yeah. or. In, you know, and I have some younger sales reps that just look at horror as yeah. I'm like, nope, it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that old adage, fail fast, right? Like yeah, just right. know that it's not a successful effort. Don't spin cycles yeah. trying to force it. And I think that is a part of sort of my mantra with partners is mm -hmm. like, I'm just going to be brutally honest and candid yeah. with you. I think it's easier that way. And I, 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 if I lie to you, I won't remember anyways. I have the memory of a goldfish. <laughs> I know that about myself, right? Your greatest strength is knowing your greatest weakness. And that's yeah. my greatest weakness. I have the memory of a goldfish. So it's like I won't remember what I lied to you about anyway. So I might as well just tell you the truth and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. I think it's easier that way for for everybody. So I love it. I think it's a good good approach. I want to ask you. I mean, you, on a personal level, I mean, you seem like you have a really good outlook, um, diverse background. You know, you're getting partnerships done. You know, what are some personal challenges that you've faced that have kind of shaped this outlook that you have? Hmm. Good question. Um, I'll peel, back, I'll peel back a few layers for you. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, I think partnerships uh, got really interesting to me when um, uh, when I went through my, my divorce, right? And you start to really sort of, you know, in that experience, right? And I've talked to a lot of, you know, guys and gals have gone through it. You know, in that experience, you start to, you know, if, if you're somewhat sensible, right, you'll do some internal reflection, you, as you should with anything, I think, in life. But definitely something like that, um, and so you know, you, I looked back um, at myself and uh, and sort of how I was managing, you know, that relationship and how I, uh, you know, what I learned from it, what I gleaned from it, how can I improve, how can I do better, how can I, you know, grow and build and you know, not repeat mistakes. And you know, this is not to say that I won't repeat mistakes. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like. Uh, you, you, you work with what you've got and you try to improve and it's iteration, right? You're honest with yourself, yeah, right? You can it's not, like this goes back to what you were just saying. Yeah. You can't say, okay, well, that didn't work, so don't do that and everything else is going to yeah. work. That's a very binary and simplistic way to look at life. Um, so I generally do, I'm generally considered to be a very optimistic person. So I'm like, okay, let's learn from it. Let's build upon it. Let's improve and let's go forward. Um, but partnerships kept ringing in my ear. And I don't know if it's because, you know, half of my day is spent thinking about my, you know, Two little girls, or or half my days, you know, and the other half is spent thinking about work, right? Like, yeah. but no, like I was like, it's funny when you think about partnerships. What are what are partnerships? It's trust, right? It's a commitment. It's um, it's each of us holding up our own end of the bargain, yeah. right? And it's transparency, it's honesty. It's really interesting. Like, maybe I got way too philosophical with it and trying to apply in the analogies, but I realized, oh my god. A happy, successful marriage can and should, in my mind now, be a really good partnership. Yeah. And it's lovely because it's, a, it's such a paradigm shift in my mind. I remember 
10, 15 years ago when I'd meet people. I'd be like, oh, this is my partner. And I was like, that's so weird that they call him their partner. It's obviously your wife, dude, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, okay, fine. And, you know, 2020 hindsight, because now I'm like, wow, they were way ahead of it. They, yeah. You know, they got it. Like, it truly is that. So I think that's an area where my personal, ex my personal life and my professional life just completely overlap. Hmm. My recognition that, you know, a good partnership, define it in what, in either context, is made up of communication, transparency, honesty, trust, holding up your end, and holding up your end of the bargain. Because right? oh. like, if you and I are working on a, you know, this, some some potential, you know, uh, opportunity, there's things that you're gonna just assume like, well, lead's gonna take care of it. Yeah. You know, and if we're sitting in front of the client or we're ready to, you know, hit submit on that RFP response and it hasn't been done, whew, you know what I mean? So heartbreaking, right? Yeah. Uh, not not to the same level and degree, but you, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I know it does. It's I mean, still it's... all fairly recent, so I'm still I'm honestly still pa unpacking this. That's what I mean by like, all right, I'll pull back a couple of layers in the onion, but there's a lot of layers I think still left. Yeah, there. I mean that's it's a lot to go through, yeah. and for for you to still have such a positive outlook and to to pull wisdom out of that and apply that to something you're passionate love of, you know, yeah. I mean it's like that's just going to come back to you fivefold too as you go out and open yourself up and get in that next relationship, I mean, it's just going to be that much more powerful. Yeah, yeah, right? I think, I think um, you know, you, you, are, uh, you are a diamond formed under pressure, right? It's yeah. like those experiences and that, you know, whether it's that heat and that pressure or that experience really starts to just crystallize and you know, strengthen your core. And, and, and I think that's important because you go through, um, through, life in general and you know uh, a, a relationship um and you want somebody who's got a, that strong core yeah because life is going to come at you right i mean yeah good god did life come at you two weeks ago <laughs> I mean, what was the name of that hurricane by the way uh barrel? hurricane barrel barrel right? like a terrible name <laughs> Terrible bear. I mean, like I was. I, I, so that's I mean, the second. That's I've been through many hurricanes. Good God. Because I, I used to live in New Orleans, so Katrina was the big one. Oh, you were there. I was there Katrina. for Katrina. Oh my God. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Tip to you, my friend. Well, so I, I can't say it was there because I actually evacuated from okay. it. So we, we evacuated to a town called Lafayette, okay. which I think. Oh God, my geography. It's about a hundred miles. Uh, west of New Orleans, okay. which is where, when there's an eye of the storm, you want to be in this side of the hemisphere. You want to be to the west of it. Yep. They call it the dirty. The dirty side is the east side because the way it rotates off the ocean. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So by the time it hits you on the west side, it's gone up over the land, and then it's coming back down, it's dumping yeah. everything on the east side. Yeah, and oh, so man. it's it's just not as bad. And so, yeah. I mean, just long story short, you know, we decided to do a last minute trip for Fourth of July. We wanted to go to the beach. We did a big spring break travel trip. So we're like, we're not buying, I get to buy five plane tickets it's, and then get a dog sitter. Yeah, you know, yeah, so like, yeah. let's just drive somewhere and take the dog. And then we're like, well, let's go to the beach. Ah, Galveston is 16 hours away. Like, we're not afraid of road trips. Let's do it. We have a, a van with 200,000 miles. Oh my God. We got it checked out. Everything checked out. Good. Drove on down there. As soon as we get there, transmission problems. Oh my God. And it's like... This. We could still drive it. It's clear there's something wrong. Some days it seems like it's okay. Other days it's like, I don't know. So they have to order a part for it. And so we're waiting for the part. We're tracking the storm. You know, the storm hasn't hit the Yucatan yet. And it's supposed to go through the Yucatan and then kind of up and hit right. the border. Yeah. And uh, I've seen this before because when Because it essentially threaded the needle, right? Uh, below the Florida coast because it Katrina, it won't... Katrina went right through Florida. Okay. Kind of. But this one kind of went. This South one with the Yucatan, hit the Yucatan. But the, the funny thing with Katrina was, right when it was about to hit Florida, coming out of Florida, it had the cone, and just the tip of the cone was touching New Orleans. Okay. Yeah, and so this was kind of the same, where it was going to go through the Yucatan, and then just the tip of the cone was touching Galveston, like not even. But every you, Meanwhile, you're just driving there. Oh, yeah. by the way, the transmission is yeah. bunk. Every day, that, that cone shifted, shifted, shifted. And sure enough, like we weren't supposed to get anything in Galveston, and we got a Hurricane One in Galveston, and we had a front row seat to the ocean. We had war an Airbnb, water just pouring through the windows. My wife and I, for eight hours, were mopping up water off the floor with towels because there's it's an Airbnb, there's no mop, so we're just wringing out towels in the shower, mopping up. No, no power for three days with three young kids in Galveston, Texas, with 100 degrees, with 100 percent humidity. Unbelievable. Yeah, so it got to the point where my wife was so desperate. She's like, we have to go. So after three days, we finally found a rental car. Yeah, yeah. 
Because a lot of places weren't open, they didn't have power. Right, right. Places that were open didn't have rental cars. We finally found a rental car. We're like, screw it. You know, the, the dealership's still not open. We're gonna just try to limp the car home. We put the family in the rental car so nothing bad would happen, and I'm driving the van, and we made it 90 miles, and the transmission blew on the freeway. <laughs> Unbelievable. Like, so even after I heard about the transmission problem, yeah. you still drove it 90 miles, and still, then yeah, still more did. transmission problems, yeah, got it. And so we, we ended up towing it to another dealership. They're like, yeah, we could probably fix it in a week for 10 grand, and yeah. it's like a 200,000 mile minivan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're like, just, just scrap it. We got 500 bucks. We got half of our stuff out of the minivan, because it's, it's a smaller rental car. Right. It's like a small yeah, it's not gonna fit everything. Couldn't fit everything. We left everything from our Yakima rack to all sorts of stuff in the van. Unbelievable. Half our stuff left in the van and drove away. Just a liquidation we were, sale we like were just, we, that, I mean, it's just, it, it shows you the desperation. We were just I, I so desperate I mean, to get home. I feel for you, three days in those conditions with three kids. I was, there was no fans, and your no animal, AC. And your, one dog, two dogs. Yeah, a chocolate lab. Yeah. So we couldn't fly home because the, he, you know, well, I figured there's no flights available. There were some, like two days. Houston was shut down for a day with the airport. They got the power back onto the airport. But um, they have a summer embargo on dogs. So the only dogs you can take on a plane, plane have to go on the plane with the passengers. Oh, in the, okay. you know, in the wintertime, you can check, check the dog. Right, but right. in the summertime, you can't because it gets too, too hot, hot in the yeah. tarmac. And so... The dog was the reason we were really stuck there. We would have, we would have just, we would have flown out of. We just, we left the van and flown home, you know. But like the dog, you know, don't, don't bring your dog on vacation. I guess. Unbelievable! Wow, so, that is commitment. But you know, going back to what you said though, like it, it, it was so easy for me to get caught up in what was wrong with the situation, right. and then you know, God bless my three-year-old. He's like, we're like two days into this power outage disaster, eating canned raviolis and. He's like, best vacation ever. <laughs> You're like, so it's like, dad of the year. Yeah, you know, so it's like, you know, we're all, we're all safe. We have food. We yeah. have water. And That's it's amazing. like, and you're together. he's, he's yeah. have, you know, it's like, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. We could find a new van. And it's just, you got to, you just got to, you got to force yourself to find perspective, oh, you know, whether that's, incredible. whether that's wisdom or just the, the fun that you can have. And that, that can be really hard in those situations, though, because like, there's a lot you can point to that's not going well. God, you know? when I got your email and my response was, hey, you know, sounds like the kids are gonna get just the adventure that they were yeah. hoping for. <laughs> I did not expect it to have gone that bad. So I'm so sorry, God. Oh. But I mean, like you said, yeah, it's a perspective. It's, yeah. you know, there's, there's, pardon my French, shit's gonna happen. Yeah. This is life, is what yeah. I tell people. I'm like, this is, it's gonna happen. Yeah. And so you have one of two ways to deal with it, you know? Curling up in the corner is never an option. I don't yeah. care. People think it is. It's not. All right. So you either accept it and you know and sort of adjust and you know iterate and improve and build, or you wallow and yeah. fall victim to it, which will still have its own consequences, and you'll still have to take actions to deal with those consequences. Yeah. You know? No, yeah. I think you're right. And, and there's a quote I love, and I don't I don't hundred percent believe it, but it's it's adversity doesn't build character; it defines it. And, you know, I, I think we still can learn a lot from adversity and, yeah. and help build us up. But, but I do think that just how you handle certain situations really does define your character. And it's something we got to constantly think about. Like, how am I handling the situation? And, and what is this teaching other people, especially with kids, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, they're, they're looking at us and how we're handling this. Yeah. And yeah. they're learning how to handle it themselves through us. And, like, that's... That, that says, that that says volumes about mom and dad if your three-year-old is, like, best vacation ever. <laughs> Or, or, may, or, or maybe, you know, the exciting part was just watching mom and dad mop all day. Oh, jeez. Well, I mean, they can sleep through anything, so it's unbelievable. That's so impressive. Well, this, is, this has been fun. I've, I've learned a lot. Absolutely I, enjoy. Thank I, you. You and I got to go out for beer sometime. I'm looking forward to it. I, I want to ask you one last question, and you're, you're a worldly man, man of a lot of advice, and, and just what advice do you want to leave for people out there? Uh, wow. You know, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of... of the, the 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 label that I've been given by folks that like well you're, per, you're the perpetual optimist you're always uh, you know good times will lead right and and I think it's it's that you stay positive you know uh, who is it Winston Churchill said right when you're going through hell keep going <laughs> Just keep going because uh, you know you'll if you if you start to get negative and not push and not 
and give up, essentially. I think that's what it is. I'm a stubborn mule. I just refuse to give <laughs> up. You know, I don't care yeah. if it's a third world war zone. I'm, I'm like, I'm not giving up. We're going to build this. Um, and I think that is uh, that attitude um, of like keeping an eye on, on sort of what potentially could be positive in, ex in an experience is critical to not just, like you said, the impact you're going to have on whether it's your children or your colleagues or yeah. folks in, you know, that are observing you you know, strangers that are observing you at a distance, but how your internal, even biochemistry is going to respond to that, you know? You yeah. think about the release of serotonin and dopamine and cortisol in different situations and how that affects your physiology. And, I mean, God, don't get me started. Like I said, I love the field of science. So there's, there's, I think there's a lot to it in that regard. So my advice is just, you know, if, if you're going through it, keep going and stay positive. And even if you have to lie to yourself and be like I swear I'm being positive no just I think the repetitive verbally hearing yourself say it and and trying to find the you know uh, the pluses in an otherwise negative situation I think it goes a long way you know we don't realize it I think we only realize it much later on in life I love it I love it well cheers Waleed here's to being positive Absolutely. and keep going my pleasure Thank thanks you so for much coming for on me. I appreciate it cheers